Shalom, shalom. On this incredible festival of trumpets on this very day, it is an honor for me to be here with you. And I just want to start this off just with another prayer. So Father, Lord, we just invite you into this room right now. Holy Spirit, come. Lord, you are welcome. We give you authority in this room, in this place. And Father, everything, Lord, that exalts itself up to the knowledge of God that is not of you, God, we command it to leave this place. Lord, we thank you, Father, for your truth, Lord, to come, Lord, and just invade this place, Lord. And Father, if there is anything in our hearts, including mine, Lord, come, Lord, and purge it from us. Lord, this is a day of purging, a day of joy, but a day of purging. So Lord, we submit ourselves to you and we say, God, come, have your way, Lord. We need you to come. We need you in this place. We need you. We need you. Without you, there we can go home. It means nothing. We need you, Lord. Come, Father, into this place. Amen. And so I just want to say, you know, thank you all for coming here. If you have never, if this is your first time or if the feast days is a new idea to you, it is an incredible time because it is all like markers on our Father's calendar to prepare us for the times that are coming. And every single one of the feast days of the Father points to Yeshua. It is fulfilled by Him. We have the spring feast, for example, where He is the Passover lamb that, that has come for us. And on Passover, 2,000 years ago, He was the lamb that was sacrificed. On the festival of unleavened bread, right after that, He was put in the grave in the midst of Israel, taking the sin, the leaven, out of their homes. We have him being raised on the festival of first fruits, and 50 days later, we have the Holy Spirit poured out on Pentecost, or also known as Shavuot in Hebrew. And then we see that's kind of where the Father has left it. We see the last feast that have been fulfilled in that way, kind of Pentecost, Shavuot, and now we're entering this place of the full feast where we are standing today, the festival of trumpets. And this festival is, like I mentioned in that prayer, it's a day of excitement and joy because the King is coming. Hallelujah, the King is coming. Yes. But at the same time, it's going to be a day where it's going to be like the clock striking 12 and the time is up. There is not going to be one more second, no more chances to get right with God on your own and, not, and also... Never again will we have the privilege, never again, think about this guys, you will never again after that moment have the privilege of sharing the gospel of someone who has never heard of the true God of Israel. Because everyone will know, whether they're on that or this side of him, they will know. And so we have a privilege in this temporary life, it's a temporary place, it's going to pass away, life is but a vapor that appears for just a little while and then passes away forever and you will never again be able to sit in the position you are in today with that honor that he has entrusted to us with. And so the festival of trumpets is also a day, a, fe a feast that is connected with the, is, I want to call it the fulfillment of the born again speech that Yeshua talked about with Nicodemus. What he said, he said, what did he say? You need to be born again in water and spirit. And what is the festival of trumpets? There will be a blowing of trumpets as it's prophesied. And those who are alive in him will be raised and they will be raised imperishable. Their bodies will be, the flesh will stay behind. And we will be truly, fully born again. We will not have the flesh keeping us back in any way anymore. And so the Father desires of us in this life now to start that born again process of walking as He walked in spirit and truth, being baptized in water and spirit. And then we carry this thing into eternity. And so I want to ask you a question as we begin here. As I was preparing for this, the Father laid it on my heart that there would be something in this room that would be prevalent. And it is something that's not even going to be in this room, but it is something that has to do with the age we're in, and it's something that has been prevalent biblically and historically speaking throughout the ages before, for, for generations before us. And I'll ask you this question. How were the months leading up to today for you? So January, February, March, I don't know about you guys, I got married at the beginning of the year, that was great. Glory to God, oh, she's right here. Okay, so that was amazing, right? things were good and then you know June July and then August hit 
And I don't know about you guys, but just about a month, two, three months ago, things started, trials and tribulations started heading my life. You know, for just as an example, you know, us, whenever I would enter my house beginning of August, like almost like clockwork, just as August began, as I was entering my house, every time I went in, I started getting these allergic reactions all over my body, these hives, itching head to toes. And it was, we were like, what is going on? And, and it, we were actually forced out, and I live with um, my in-laws, Christina's mom and dad, and, and, we, lived, and we slept on the couch, and we, <laughs> and we lived in their, that place for a month. And it was hard for me because home, sweet home, isn't it? We love our homes. We love that place we take comfort in. And it's a small thing compared to, I know, some of the things that you guys have gone through in the past two, three months. I know there's, been, there's people sitting in this room who's lost someone. I know there's, someone, there's people in here who's gone through uh, illnesses, hospitals, maybe not big things, maybe smaller things, but we have all gone through things and it is nothing new. In fact, the Jew, our Jewish brethren, they call this the ninth of Av, this season. You may have heard of it before. And it's, this year it lands around 10, 11 August 2019. That's kind of where it started. And this is a time known throughout history, biblically and historically speaking, like I mentioned, of things that just went wrong. For example, biblically speaking, we have, it is believed that in the ninth of Av is when the t bad report came back. And Israel is about to enter this promised homeland, this new home that the Father has made a promise to them that they will inherit. Another example, historically speaking, both the temples were destroyed in this time. The first and the second temple of God were destroyed, and Israel was forced, of course, with that, to, to leave their homes, to be dis, dis, dispatched, dispersed. We have the Jews expelled from England in 1290 by Edward, King Edward. We have the Jews expelled from Spain, 1942. People thrown out of their homes, leaving their homes. We have World War I beginning in the same uh, season. And we, there's a lot of historians who even believe World War II is simply the, success, the continuation of World War I, the unfinished business of World War I. So we have these world wars, all these incredible, horrible things beginning in, these, in this age. But what is the connection between all these events? What is the golden thread that's going all throughout them? We have the spies not being able to enter their land. We have holy temples destroyed. God's holy place, if you will. Jews thrown out of their homes. World War I, we can know, Holocaust, people thrown out of their homes. It's almost like God has a history lesson for us in here. Don't get too invested. Don't get too comfortable. Don't get too attached to this place. Don't be like this rich man who thought that he could bury his Bentley with him and it'll go to heaven with him. Rather, the Father says, and the Word says, that what you enter this world with nothing and you will leave with nothing. But the world teaches something else. The world says, invest in this world. Invest in everything you can in this world. Get, get the car, get the house, get the family, get the American dream, all of it, get it. And hey, I'm not against a house, a car, a family. Of course not. But the problem is, is when that becomes the thing that rules over us. The question is really, do you own your possessions or do they own you? And I'm not just talking about physical possessions here. You see, when we talk about the, world, the word slavery, it simply means, the definition of slavery is, is whenever there is something that has dominion or control or power over you. Something that you cannot say no to when it comes to where the rubber hits the road. You, we can say as much as we want, we are not slaves, we are free. But if there is something in your life that has a hold on you, and it's not God, you're a slave to that thing, right? And so, this is exactly what Yeshua talked to the Pharisees about. And they said to him the following, we are the offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say, Yeshua, that we will become free? Yeshua answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. Right? He's saying, 
If you practice sin, you can say as much as you want, you're free. He's talking to this Pharisee. He's like, you can say as much as you want. You're the sons of Abraham. You've inheritance. You've all these things. But as long as you practice sin and you are in that habitual sin, you cannot break free from it. You are a slave. And then he says that interesting thing thereafter. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. And then the Pharisees looked at him, and I bet you they were kind of like, what? what are you talking about? It's a good thing, you know, we don't have sin either. It's a good thing that we are righteous, right? Isn't it kind of like that story Yeshua talked about? I want to tell you that story. There's two men. They go up to the temple to pray. The one is a Pharisee. The other is a tax collector. The Pharisee. He goes to the temple to pray and he lifts up his head to the heavens, his eyes to the heavens, and he says, Oh Lord, I thank you I'm not like other men. I fast twice a week and give tithes of all that I own. Oh Father, I thank you I'm not like these swindlers, these corrupt men. I thank you, Lord. Oh Father, I thank you I'm not like this tax collector. God, I thank you I'm not like other men. And then the tax collector, he couldn't even lift up his head to the heavens. Instead, he, he beat his chest and he says, Father, forgive me, a sinner. And Yeshua said this, that man, the tax collector, went away justified instead of the Pharisee. Doesn't that sound familiar? Father, I thank you. I'm not like other men. Lord, I thank you. I'm not like these Christians who can't keep a Sabbath or these Christians who they, they can't keep a feast day. Or Father, I thank you. I've got a better diet than they have. And oh, Father, I thank you. I'm not like in those sins that I was in. And oh, Father, I thank you. I'm not like other men. What's really the difference between the Pharisee and the tax collector? What was really the difference between them. You see, the Pharisee continuously boasted in what he has been doing, in what he's been, he's been doing right, so much that he was completely veiled and blinded from anything that he is doing wrong or has ever done wrong. And the tax collector was repenting for everything he'd done wrong, even though there was nothing he's ever done right. <laughs> and the father says, you are justified. That thief on the cross next to Yeshua, he, he's on that cross and he says, Yeshua, I am a murderer, I am a sinner, I don't deserve, I deserve what I'm here for. And he looks over to Yeshua, this holy, righteous, perfect man, and he says, I am not worthy of what you are about to inherit. And he says, Yeshua, when you enter the kingdom of God, just think of me. Just think of me. Just, just let my name enter your mind just for a second because I am not even worthy. I'm barely worthy of that. Yeshua, just do that for me. And Yeshua looks at him and says, Oh, brother, oh, brother, you will be there with me today, I tell you. You will be there with me. You see, if we were to drag... Oh, I want to ask you this question before I go on. What is that sin? What is the thing in your heart? What is the thing in your life that you've been veiled from seeing because you are, you are seeing all the things you've do, been doing right. You are seeing all the things that you've, and glory to God, glory to God for this joyous time. Glory to God for being here. Glory to God for keeping his commandments and desiring to do that. Glory to God for all of that. Glory to the Father for it all. But I want to ask you, I want to warn you, do not fall into this trap of thinking, well, I have all these good deeds so as long as I've got all these right things and they outweigh my bad things, I'll be all right. Because my good deeds are enough. My good deeds will justify me before the Father. And you know, sometimes I know we, 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 we all know this, this scripture, how Paul has, has hammered it. You know, we are saved by faith, through grace, or by grace, through faith. But do we actually live that way? Do we actually truly, it's easy to say that, but do we actually live our life in every area of our life in that way? Because see, if we were to take that Pharisee 
and that tax collector before an earthly judge, all right? Let's just think about this for a second. Pharisee, tax collector, we put them before an earthly judge, a really righteous earthly judge, and we say the law of God is the law. And we ask that judge, can you just judge? Look at this Pharisee, talk to him. Look at the tax collector, talk to him. And tell us, who is the more righteous man? Who is the man who is a better man? Will that judge not say, well, the Pharisee, he's probably a better man. He tithed, he did all these things, he, he kept the Sabbath, he, he did all these things. The tax collector, in fact, would be so horrible, he would just testify everything he's ever done wrong before this judge, this earthly judge, right? And the, tax, and the Pharisee would never admit to anything. How is it that when we go before an earthly judge, we would think that a Pharisee, he looks better, he's better dressed, he would make it in. But God, in, in, in fact, he says the opposite. He says that, that wretched tax collector, that one who's in sin, he is the one justified. And of course, we know at the root of all this is the pride that the Pharisee had, right? But there's another dimension to this that I want to share with you. The one, uh, one of them is a slave, and the other one has passed from a slave to be a son. Can you guess who's who? The Pharisee was a slave. And that, remember when Yeshua talked to that Pharisee? He said, whoever does sin is a slave to sin. And he says then, the slave does not abide in the father's house forever, but the son abides forever. Have you ever read that? Have you ever thought about what is he even really saying? What does he mean by that? If I may explain, like, if you, let's just think about this in practical senses, because that's how Yeshua works. He, to, he, he talks about there is a son, and there is a slave in a father, a master's house. Now, if we just think about this rationally, a house, any house, your house, when you go home, you have a house, and you have house rules in your house. That master, that father, he has house rules. And he might even be like going to the living room of the house and he might even put a nice uh, a, a, a plaque there and he might have all the rules of the house on, on that wall. And that, those rules apply to both his slave or his servant as well as his son. The same rules apply, right? Wouldn't it be different. Now I know that we don't live in a place where we have slaves anymore, but just bear with me here. The slave, what is the difference between the slave and the son? Why does Yeshua say that the slave will one day go, but the son is always welcome and abides forever? What is it? You see, there is a difference between the relationship that a master has with a slave and that a master has with a son. It's a relationship, but it's a different relationship. You see, the slave's relationship is built on what he does for his master, his works. And that's, that's good. He, he wants to do the house rules and he, he's obedient to that. But as soon as that slave makes a big mistake, he's no, well, he's no longer welcome and a new slave can come and take, take his place. Because that relationship is simply built on works. It's simply built on how good of a slave that slave is. But this son, why is he different? Because he has a father-son relationship with his father. And what is that relationship? What, does it, what makes it that you may have a son and that is your son? Let's just think about this in simple terms. It's the fact that that son was born of you, right? It is the fact that that son, you brought that son into the world. He's part of your family. And secondly... It is the fact that that son knows it. Because if he doesn't, he's what we call an orphan. He is what we call, you know, when, when we have children born to, and, and then their parents don't want them and they end up in a, somewhere and then they don't know their parents and they can even become what we call an orphan. And so, but the, that son in the father's house is a son that has a special kind of relationship with that father. A relationship that that slave cannot have. Here's the thing though is that son, like I said, has the same rules that he has to abide by as the slave. They have the same house rules. But the thing is, is because the son loves the father so much because they have a father-son relationship and the father loves the son so much, 
the son has this desire in his heart to say, Father, you have these rules against the wall in the living room, but Father, I don't want to just do that. Father, I want to do uh, go above and beyond. I want to be your son. If I have a son, if he, a van der Westeisen, <laughs> and and I tell, and he's going to be raised to be my son, to live by the standard of my family. My slave will not be living by that same standard, right? He, he doesn't need to. But my son needs to. This is what Yeshua was getting at. He is saying, you have heard it said, murder is murder. But I tell you, whoever calls his brother a fool, he is liable to hellfire. You have heard it said that if you commit adultery, that is sin, that is wrong, that's adultery. But I tell you that if you look at a woman with lust in your heart, you've committed adultery in your heart. Do you know what he's really doing there? Look, the Torah is holy, righteous, good, perfect, amazing. But he, what he just did there, he said, that is kindergarten cute compared to what I desire a son, how I desire a son to live. It's kindergarten cute. Because I don't just desire for you to not do the act of adultery. I desire for you to live so holy, so set apart that your eyes do not wander there for a second. I desire you to live so holy that your heart never goes there to call your brother a fool. Because if you're a son, you can't do that. And see, the slave, the slave, the slave is like those at Mount Sinai. When we look at Mount Sinai, the Torah was given to these people. Glory to God, it was amazing. His holy word. But what did they do? They had no true, they didn't have that relationship with the father. They had a slave, they had transitioned from slavery to Egypt, that mindset to slavery at Mount Sinai. And it was not what the father ever desired or intended. The father laid the Torah because that is the holy law of God. That is holy and righteous and perfect. But he never, he desired for them to understand that you cannot do this alone. You cannot keep the law on your own. You alone cannot do it. Abraham and Sarah, same thing. God comes to Abraham. He says, Abraham, I'm going to make a promise to you. A promise, an, an amazing promise. Lord, the, your descendants are going to be like the stars in the heavens. It's going to be amazing, Abraham. And Abraham and actually says that when Abraham believed God's promise, that was a reckon to him as righteousness. That was the thing that he made him right with God. But what happened thereafter? Abraham goes ahead and he starts wondering. He starts because the years go by and his wife is just getting older and older. Sarah is just getting older and there is no child coming. And Abraham and Sarah, they think, well, what about, we believe in God's promise. We believe God wants to do this. But let's make a way for this to happen. And what do they do? They, they, they take Hagar, the slave woman, and they, ha and they let Abraham lie with her to bring about this child, this slave child. And what happens then? God comes up, right? God comes and he says, Abraham, what are you doing? This is not what I told you how my promise would come about. Why are you trying to do this alone? And get, get, get what he says. He says, I will bless Sarah. And moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her and she shall become nations. Kings of people shall come from her. Then Abram fell on his face and laughed. And he said to himself, shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? Shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? Abraham believed in the promise, but he didn't believe on how that promise would come about. Father has given us that promise. He has brought that promise to fulfillment. He has brought about that promise of what Yeshua has come to do for us. That promise that he is going to come back, that we are standing here today waiting for. But see, at Mount Sinai... When they said, Lord, all that you have said, Lord, all that you have said, we will do it. Did they? Did they? Were they able to? Well, if you've ever read the Torah, you'll read over and over and over and over how they weren't able to. They weren't absolutely paralyzed to do it. They couldn't. Do you know why? They were slaves. They were slaves to sin, to lawlessness. They were unable to keep it. And the father, you know what the father is really just trying to tell Israel right there? It's Israel. 
you need a father. Israel, you're trying to do this alone. You're trying to worship me. You're trying to walk like Yeshua. You're trying to be like the holiness I call you to alone. And now Yeshua even comes and he raises the standard and he says, walk like I do. And it's even a higher standard. And, and now it's like, how do we do this? And God still says, you cannot do this alone. And Israel, they realize this later. In Lamentations, we read, Lamentations 5 verse 3, we have become orphans. Israel cries out, we have become orphans, fatherless. Our mothers are like widows. We must pay for the water we drink. The wood we get must be bought. Our pursuers are at our necks. We are weary. We are given a rest. We have given the hand to Egypt and to Assyria to get bread enough. Our fathers sinned. We are no more. And we bear their iniquities. Slavery rules over us. There is no one to deliver us from its hand. And you see, to be, to enter that true relationship that, that Israel never, well, at that point they didn't. It's simply that, what I said, to be born again. And you may say, well, Peter, I've heard about that before. I've heard about this saying people say, born again, yeah. But Yeshua, when he was sitting with Nicodemus, he said, Nicodemus, you need to be born again in water and spirit. Not just water, not just spirit, water and spirit. Water, be baptized. That's the repentance like we had this beautiful baptisms this weekend. It's the repentance where we lay our lives down. We go into the water, die with Christ, get resurrected with him, right? And that's the repentance of our sins. That's the new man that gets raised. But then bore, reborn in spirit is to be immersed then in the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, like we've talked about. And like we have also talked about that it is not the same thing. It is not the thing. I know some of you haven't been here, so I just want to say this again. It's not the same thing. When you are baptized into water, it doesn't always happen where you're baptized in the Holy Spirit at once. I know it's been taught. We see in the book of Acts, I just want to share this again for, you, for those of you who have not heard of this. In the book of Acts, we have John. We have Peter. They travel all the way down to Samaria because Philip just preached the gospel there. And people were coming to repentance and he baptized people into water into the name of Yeshua. People got baptized. But then what? But John and Peter came down all the way for the purpose, all the way from Samaria, for the purpose of laying their hands on these people. That they might receive the Holy Spirit for he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized into the name of Lord Jesus. You see, there is a difference. It's not the same thing. They were baptized into Yeshua in water, but they were baptized and immersed in the Spirit. And so this is the born again process. This is what Yeshua is saying with Nicodemus. He's saying you need the full born again process so you can be a son of your father and not just a slave because Israel didn't have this. They didn't have the outpouring of the Spirit. The very thing Yeshua said, I am going so that the Holy Spirit can come down. That is one of the main reasons he left. And so that means that we need to earnestly desire that filling, that immersion of the Spirit. We need to earnestly desire because if you don't, you will be just as powerless as Israel in trying to keep the law. Look, the Pharisees, kept, they tried their best to keep the law, and, but they did not recognize love when love was walking right in front of them. They were completely blinded because they were still slaves even in their trying of keeping the law. They were still slaves, but the Father says, pass from a slave to a son understand who you are, that you are a son now. You see, it's no, it's no use then also to be born again, but think that you're still a slave, still live like one, not act like a son, because that's what orphans are. Like Israel, they were orphans. They, an orphan does not understand who their father is. But then Yeshua comes with this. Oh, I love this. He just says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments and I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him for he dwells with you and will be with you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. 
I will not leave. I have come so that you can have that with the Father, so that you can pass from not just being just a slave, but pass into having a father son relationship in your father's house, where you will go beyond and beyond because the Spirit is not satisfied with the kindergarten basic 101s of don't commit adultery. The Spirit is satisfied with the radical holiness of our Father, of making a covenant with your eyes, or the radical consecrations that. Brothers and sisters, you cannot do this by your own flesh. I just feel that the Father is just saying there is people, even though they come into His beautiful Lord, glory to God for that. But don't fall into the trap of remaining at Mount Mount Sinai. That is an amazing place to be, but then we need to move to Mount Zion to be filled with His Spirit, to to, to to, to be able to have that relationship. And so we then read, in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will rise imperishable. Imperishable we will rise. That is when the born again process is completely over and fulfilled. That is when we will dwell with our Father forever. But it starts today. It starts here. And that's what this festival is about. This festival is about searching your heart. Because one of these years, we're not going to be sitting here in such joy We're going to be hearing that trumpet and it's going to be a thing in joy, but it's going to be a thing of, wow, wow, the king is coming. The king is coming. And where are you going to be? Are you going to be like a tax collector or are you going to be like a Pharisee? That's the question. Are you going to be having a repentant heart and saying, Father, search the depths of my heart and show me where, show me where, show me where I have fallen short. I will not boast in all I have done wrong and be blinded for what, for what I, I will not boast in what I do right and be blinded for what I do wrong. I will simply boast in what you have done right. What you have done. Because brother, I don't know about you, but I don't deserve, if, if you want what you deserve, go to hell. If you want what you deserve, go to hell. He's the one, the only one worthy, the only one who has enabled us to have any chance. And he comes and he says, I will come to you. I won't leave you as orphans. And you know that that son, like I mentioned, that son in the father's house, that son can also break the law. Do you guys know that story of the prodigal son? In fact, that happened. The story of the prodigal son is about a son who went out of the father's house. He went amongst pigs. He went and sinned. And he looked at his father's slaves. And he says, Wow, even if my father's slaves are better off than I am right now because I'm dwelling with the pigs. Why don't I go to my father's house and I will go work for him like a slave and maybe then I can just be better off at least from where I am right now. But look at what happens. See, he says this. He says, I am not worthy to be called your son. He says, Father, I'm not worthy of it. You see that tax collector heart? I am not worthy, oh God, that guy on the cross. God, I am not worthy. It is not by me. I cannot, I don't deserve it. I have gotten what I deserved. I am not worthy. But then what happens is the father comes of this son. He runs to him. He hugs him. He gives him a cloak. He puts a ring on his finger. He puts sandals on his feet. He tells his slaves and he says, prepare a meal for my son was dead, but now he's alive. He has come home. And he gives him new life. And that's what the father comes to do today. He says, you may feel like you've been amongst pigs. You feel like you've, you've had sins. You feel like you've been held back. You may feel like you deserve to only be a slave or you feel like a slave. But I tell you, come, come. The father says, come, let me clothe you. Let me fill you with my spirit. Let me enable you to walk like my son. And then you will be able to be a light to this world. Then you will be able to act. Then we will be able to see this room 10 times fuller next year when we walk into that identity for this world to see. And it's happening every year. But the father wants more. We are his hands and feet. And it's time like we act like it. It's time like, so that we move into that place. So I want to just say this right now. If there is anyone in this place who have felt like you have been a Pharisee, who felt like you have thought that you've been a pretty good guy. Look, we're all good, but according to what standard? Better than the guy next to you because Yeshua is the standard. And it is about recognizing our void. It's about recognizing 
what we lack. And if you recognize a lack, I want you to come up here. I want us to pray right here. If you feel like you've been a slave to any sin, if there's a sin in your heart right now the Father's convicting you of, come up here, man, because he's the Father who sets free. If you feel like you've been held back by fear, if you've been held back by your not understanding that you're a son, not understanding, but, th- but acting like an orphan or walking as an orphan, man, come up here. I'm the first one to raise my hand. Come up here. Just keep coming up. If you feel led, just keep coming up. Father, right now, Lord, we just come to you. And Lord, we say, God, we know we are not worthy. Lord, we know you are the one who does it. You are the one who does it through us. Your spirit empowers us to keep your law as you prophesied through Ezekiel. In Jeremiah 31, 31, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And I will rub my law on their hearts and they will then walk it out. So Father, we come and we say, we need your spirit to walk this thing out, to be that light. Lord, we need you, Lord. And so Father, we do not boast in ourselves anymore. God, we realize our lack. We say, come Father, fill us, have mercy on us. Have mercy on us, God, in our failures and our sins. And Lord, we put it, we give it to you right now. We say, Father, come. And wash us clean. Lord, we just speak to every sin right now in this room, Lord. Everyone, Lord. I know there's some people right here right now, Lord, who's got something on their heart and they just want to give it up. They are tired of it. And so, Father, we come and we say, God, we give it to you right now. We give it to you right now. Come and take it. You are the only one who can. You're the only one who can take the shackles off us. You're the only one who can set us free to be a son. You are the only one. And so, Father, I thank you that we are not orphans. I thank you you came back for us in Yeshua. Yeshua. I thank you you came to deliver us because if you didn't, we would be forever slaves and we would never make it. And so, Father, we thank you for what you've done. Father, we thank you for this day. Father, this is a day where you will one day come back to. You will come back to us. You've made a promise and you have said the way is narrow. Few will find it, but I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. No one comes to the Father by their own strength. No one, I am the way. And so Father, we thank you. Lord, come and show us how, teach us how to walk. Come Lord, put a fire in us. Father, we pray, Lord, give us new hearts, Lord. Lord, take every bit of pride, wreck our hearts. Take the pride from our hearts. Take it. We don't want it. And we ask, Lord, come. Take it from us. Give us new hearts. Take out our heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh. A heart that is changed into a way that it becomes natural for us to be keeping the law. Natural. It becomes our nature. Do that, Lord, right now, Lord. And every one of us, come, Father. Do it. Lord, we thank you for your freedom, Lord. Your shalom, God. And we thank you for this feast. Lord, come speedily, Father. Come speedily. Come quickly. But Father, also at the same time, give us a burning flame so we may proclaim this to the ends of the earth. We pray this in the name of Yeshua.